when I was in St. Louis, when I was in Atlanta, when I was in Dallas, I wasn't getting introduced to people who were then introducing me to people that like fit my exact needs in that exact moment in time in life. And so that alignment, like you can't put a price on that. Welcome to the latest episode of Be Attento. I am Jesse Ulrich, CEO of Rant9 Productions and editor of this podcast. The Be Attento podcast offers helpful tips and stories from some of today's most successful entrepreneurs and investors, and is brought to you by Attento Capital, a Telsa-based venture fund focused on driving returns through early-stage venture investment and local economic development and job creation. Attento is Spanish for helpful, careful, thoughtful, conscientious, and polite. As Attento Capital seeks to embody these characteristics to all of its stakeholders. In today's episode, our two new hosts, Sean and Aaron, interview the former host of this podcast, Chandler Malone, to hear about his new company, Ideate, and why Telsa is the perfect place to both live and start a company. We would like to welcome you to episode one of season two of Be Attento. And we have a wonderful guest today, amazing man, a husband, entrepreneur, at heart, he has a remarkable story. I mean, we're very excited to hear that story today. We bring to you another than Chandler Malone. Welcome, Chandler. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, man. Super glad to be here. Absolutely. We're glad to have you. So who is Chandler Malone? Tell us your story. Man, I guess how far back should I go? Let's go back to the basketball player in high school that was getting the wonderful clips in the paper and the offer letters. Yes. The yeah. offer letters and all that type of stuff. Let's start there. Yeah. So I feel like by the time high school had come around, I loved basketball and definitely wanted to play, you know, at the highest level that I could, but I was very aware that I wasn't going to be able to play at the highest level. And so at that point, I really wanted to just use basketball to optimize for getting into the best institution that would be able to jumpstart my career. And so that led me to Washington University in St. Louis. And when I went there, my initial goal was to go be an attorney. When I looked at just the people close to me and in my family who were most successful, had the most financial stability, it was people who had become lawyers. And that was basically my only reason why. And about, yeah, I guess my sophomore year, I started getting a lot more exposure to different things. The first thing happened, our starting point guard helps me get involved with a foundation that would host biannual events. And the events would typically bring in anywhere from twenty five to fifty thousand dollars per event that we would donate to either St. Louis public schools or organizations that supported St. Louis public schools. And so from that, I obviously saw like how lucrative like these events were. And simultaneously, I had another group of friends that I would go to concerts with. And one of my friends who would typically organize us going to the concerts one day slipped up and told us that she was making a little bit of money per ticket that we would buy from her. And so in that moment, I was like, we're not going with like groups any greater than five or six. We could probably make this a little bit bigger. And so we made a Facebook page. We made a website, did a little bit of branding stuff. And so for our first event as an official company, we had 100 attendees and we made a little commission off of each ticket. And so we did it again, had 150 attendees, basically didn't touch any of that money and then just put it all into hosting our own event so that we weren't getting two to five dollars per ticket, but we were taking home the whole pie. And that quickly grew and it was a great experience for me. And it made me realize, I'm not sure if I want to be a lawyer. This whole entrepreneurship thing is fun. It's a liberating. It's a challenge. It almost feels like I'm like almost like playing sports again. And in that same semester, I took a class about technology and just like the cultural impacts that it had. So nothing really business focused nothing really technical focus, just how it changes the way that people interact with one another and even themselves. And in that, in that class, I ended up writing a 20 page research paper on Square and on Snapchat. And on Snapchat, I saw the founder was like a year older than I was at the time when he started the company. And at Square, I saw that someone who was in the St. Louis community who had ties to my university had built a publicly traded company from just an idea. And so that was extremely empowering. And I saw how fast those companies were able to grow. You couldn't help but see how they're doing from the business side when you're doing research on them. And so I'm like, I like entrepreneurship. 
now let me figure out how to get in this technology piece because I don't really know anything about it other than like me reading an article or me interacting with it. And from there, left my time doing the event production company and went and did an internship at a venture capital firm in St. Louis. And my real goal there was to be able to learn how to speak the language in the technology entrepreneurship space. I didn't know what the whole SaaS software as a service, like what that even meant at that time. And being able to pick up some of just the lexicon, but also understanding like the different business models and kind of opportunities and ways to grow and scale was super empowering to me and my goals as an entrepreneur. And so after I finished my internship there, started a three plus two MBA program at Wash U, which was, it was a great experience for the first six weeks, but I realized that was not necessarily the best thing for me. So <laughs> I only made it through six weeks and I started my next company, which was a mobile event ticketing platform. So I'm like, look, I'm new to this whole technology thing. I'm not going to build a technology company in a space that I don't know anything about. I know a lot about event ticketing. I would be the customer for this. And so basically our biggest value adds were that we had text message invitations. I want to give a shout out to Respond Flow. It, it was there that text message open rates were so much higher than email open rates. And in my previous company, we would send emails out to our constituents to let them know about events. And so I thought that would be a huge value add for event host. And then the entire event could be uh, managed mobily from your phone, from the creation of the event to sending out the invitations to scanning and checking folks in. And then the final piece is we had the lowest transaction fees in the ticketing space. I will say that lowest transaction fees, no one really cared about that. <laughs> and so built that company, learned a lot of lessons from that, took a lot of lumps. In our strongest times, we were making three to five grand a month. And so it was not a runaway company by you know any stretch, but I did learn how to grow and scale it. We built it to over 80,000 users. We hosted over 500 events on the platform. And so I realized I need to get a little bit better on like the pricing and like the revenue generation side, but I felt we were able to do all right scaling. Unfortunately, there's this piece of differentiation. And so like our text message tool, it was built on top of a company called Twilio that allows companies to send text messages. And so there was nothing actually special about that technology. And so eventually Eventbrite and Ticketmaster both integrated these same two technologies. And for us, Eventbrite was more of a competitor than Ticketmaster. We couldn't get into the, the venues that Ticketmaster was in because Live Nation had exclusive contracts with a lot of these venues. And as soon as Eventbrite, they've got their mobile app, they've got the text message invitations. And we're like, hey, we'll save you two cents on the dollar from Eventbrite. And our previous clients, like they would continue to use us because they felt comfortable. But new clients would be like, we're just going to use Eventbrite because we've always used it and we know it works and you have nothing different. And so at that point, it was like, let's try to get a little bit of something for this rather than ride it out until it dies. Because we didn't necessarily have the team on the technical side or the resources to be able to like iterate and pivot quickly. I moved down to Atlanta to work on the company, which basically moved there because the tech ecosystem in Atlanta was emerging very strong. You had great schools, you had a good amount of capital, but it's also definitely a media and entertainment hotspot. And as I'm looking to find people who are hosting events, and not people who are hosting one-off events, but organizations that host multiple events, it seemed a city with a lot of independent record labels would make a ton of sense. And yeah, through that time, yeah, I guess. You learned a lot. Yeah, yeah, I learned a lot. You got your business off the ground, you got this thing going, and and then you phase and you come into the VC space, you're with Atento Capital, and, and then going back to founder again. Talk a little bit about that journey, entrepreneur, VC, back to, to founder again. What is that? What do you know now that you didn't know then? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so much. I remember in my previous company, The Moves, there were times where I was frustrated and I felt like I wasn't getting a fair shake when it came to being able to raise capital. I was like, look, we've got monthly revenue coming in, this, that, and the third. But at the end of the day, now, if a company is making a little bit of revenue, but they don't have the team there, then I'm going to be less interested with my investor hat on. Even in comparison to a company that's not generating revenue, but has a great team. And so that was one of the things in building out this newest company, IDA. That was super important to just be able to find not just folks who had the talent, but also had the disposition to be great team members, to be great managers of others, the grit and the drive to be willing to take maybe a pay cut to be able to build out vision and the people who have the ambition for that. And that's not a knock to those who don't, 
But those were things that were really important to be able to find. And so we're really happy that, that we've been able to get some of those folks. In terms of other things that I learned, I think a lot of the best companies, they pivot pretty early on. And you maybe understand a general problem. And you're out there, you're talking to customers, and you get a product out there to them in the wild. And they don't respond exactly the way that you thought that they would, even though you talk to a bunch of them. But you look at like a company like Slack. Slack started off as a mobile game. And now it's a communications platform. That's where having that team of just really special people, that's where you can understand, okay, look, we started off in this direction, but maybe we need to switch on the drop of a dime. And you brought up something key there. You're talking about the team and and the value of the team. How do you get the team to buy into your vision when there's little capital coming in? Can you you speak a little bit to that? How how do you get that buy-in? There's nothing to buy them with. Yeah. (laughs) I I will say with investor hat on, I've told people getting finding that team is harder than selling customers. You can build something that customers will buy eventually if you talk to enough of them. I think we talk about some of the inequities in venture capital and like the startups that get funding. And a lot of it can come down to ability to recruit such a team. And I know for me, my ability to recruit our team came from a lot of the connections that I made at my university. And I went to a fancy school just to call it for what it is. And I had a network of friends who were working in product and in software engineering at your Googles, your Facebooks, your Amazons, your Microsofts, to where it was basically like, hey, you have a relationship with me or other people that have a relationship with me so they can underwrite to my character. And so now I've got a captive audience. You're listening to me. And so if what I'm laying down is something that is interesting to you and you see a path for it to grow and be successful, then all of a sudden you've got an opportunity. And that's not necessarily going to convince them, but you've got an opportunity. Obviously, you're going, you're, you just started ID8, but like putting on your investor hat for just a second. One of the things that you and I have talked about before is like, there's always red flags whenever a company comes and pitches us. And the thing we have to keep an eye out for is like green flags, like the things that you're like, oh, wow, okay, this company could actually pull something like this off. And I feel like the ability to build a team and not even have only have the most basic product or only just have a vision. Talk about like how impactful that is and like what that means to in, to in, like in the eyes of, of investors, like when we when they see something like that. Yeah, I will quote another investor who's got more experience <laughs> to underwrite to. And it maybe means a little bit yeah. more coming from them. But I know in, in one of our earlier episodes, we have Marlon Nichols come on the show. Yeah. And one of the things that he said when that he looks for in teams is just extremely charismatic founders who can get people to do things that don't necessarily make sense for them in the moment. And they've got a few industries that they're into, but it's really about the founders. Do you have that it factor? Yeah. Can you just attract those people? You're just, I feel like that's one of the things that may not be talked about a whole lot about founders is they are just magnets for talent. Yep. And they can just draw people in, even with just a vision, which is incredible. And I, I think part of that, you talk about green flags, but also things that draw people in with a vision. If it's a problem that you have experienced yourself and you understand intimately, then that gives you increased credibility as you're pitching to your team members as to, hey, we're going to stick this thing out when it gets hard. But also, we know enough about this to really build and solve this problem because it's something that one of us or all of us have experienced at some point in our lives. Yeah. Why build ID8 in Tulsa, Oklahoma? Wonderful place. It's had a rich history, but it's not San Francisco. It's not L.A. It's not Atlanta. It's not uh, New York. It's Tulsa. And so why choose to come here in the heart of America and, and, and build here? So first I have to give shout outs to my mom and my wife because it was, if if it wasn't for both of them, I don't know how much I would have really considered the city. And that's being completely candid and honest. My mom moved here in 2018. And when I, you know, first got an opportunity to come here, I was like, ah, I'm not a hundred percent sure. And my wife was like, you need to go do that. When did it? I'll say since I've been here and the things that make me excited to build and grow here, the first thing is the community. I feel like in the actual early stage, like tech and venture space, because the city is not so massive, all of a sudden you step in and you're working on something, you have access to everyone. And maybe you don't raise capital your first time around, but you can talk to folks. And because it is small of a community, you'll be able to get feedback and people will be able to take you seriously. And so that no might just be a not now. I think on the other side, again, 
I talk about the community being small. The Tulsa metro area has almost a million people. And so it is sufficient size so that when talent does open up on the market, the community is small enough that there is the talent that you're looking for as soon as it comes to the market. For us right now, I'd say the average age of our team is probably like 24, 25. When a senior software engineer with 20 years of experience comes onto the market as a free agent, we've been able to hear about those folks within a few weeks of that happening. And at the end of the day, we've talked about building a team. You can't build a company without talent. And so being able to have access to that talent immediately and be in those networks has been great. And then I think the last thing is I try to do better about emphasizing like price and cost because I know when you're building a product, that's not necessarily like your differentiator. <laughs> but I will say in the early stages of the company, it's not about getting the TechCrunch articles and like all the stuff that people deem sexy. It's about getting your business up off the ground making money. Exactly. Yep. And the cost of doing business is so much lower down here mm-hmm. that you've got more room to experiment. You might be able to bring people in at a slightly lower salary and they're still taking home more money. So they're not really feeling the heartburn about having a lower salary, but you've got extended runway. You're taking yeah. $1 and stretching it into 10. Yeah. 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 I was talking to somebody earlier this week and we were talking about customer success roles in San Francisco. It's running anywhere from 80 to $110,000 a year. Oh my God. Here, it's forty, fifty thousand dollars a year for the same quality person and a lower likelihood of that person churning and going to a new company because they got a ten percent and, know, and they can increase. and they can live comfortably here on forty to fifty thousand dollars. Like they're going to be happy at home, and if they're happy at home, they're going to be better workers. Yep. Oh yeah, that's a huge part of the equation. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. I feel like you know one of the things that like cities like Tulsa always talk about. And it's interesting to hear someone like Devin Laney at 36 Degrees North, which is our big co-working space here in, in Tulsa. One of the things he talks about is how like, hey, saying, hey, we have a lower cost of living or a lower cost of doing business. It's not really a competitive advantage anymore for cities like Tulsa to say, because a Chattanooga or a Birmingham, which is where I was living before. And Aaron and I, and I just had a conversation with a guy who was in Detroit and we, he was asking us, what's important to attend to. And obviously it's creating jobs and and generating quality returns, which is going to a really wonderful foundation and whatnot. But he was like, every city has a different approach to ecosystem building. And he asked Aaron and I, he's like, what is Tulsa essentially doing differently? And Aaron and I both basically said was, we're taking a a bottoms up approach. Obviously VC, Tulsa 100, working with small businesses, funding, helping to fund small businesses, helping to fund venture backable startups. But we're also taking this top-down approach where we're going out and recruiting some of these bigger businesses to open up offices here. And because that's just getting people here and getting that quality of talent here and having those, when someone looks up Tulsa online and goes to the Wikipedia page and goes to the economy section, they're like, oh my gosh, they have an office there? That's amazing. I didn't even think about that. And and that's going to get talent here and that's going to, and hopefully that talent goes on to start a business and it's just this domino effect. Yeah, you've even seen it in Tulsa Remote so far. A, from what I understand, the majority of folks who get Tulsa Remote, they either work in software engineering or software sales. So that's like (laughs) building a talent force out here. But you've seen there's a precedent of people coming in town, working for one company, doing Tulsa Remote, and they fall in love with the city, fall in love with the community, and they leave and they go get a job with or even lead new organizations in town. Like you look at like the Holberton School, for example, and you've seen that with numerous of, the, of their yeah. team members. And so I think for startup founders, you've got your Amazon, your Microsoft, all of those blue chip tech companies. You've got some of those engineers here and you've got a chance at poaching them if, if you've got something solid. So so real quick, Chandler, let's go back. You mentioned your first company in college. What was the name of it? It was called Pyramid Productions. Yeah. And what ended up happening? Did you, did you exit or like how did you... Yeah. So I ended up leaving the company. I will say doing business with friends, there are a lot of pros to it, but it it was a difficult transition because it was one of my best friends. And I'm glad we've grown and still continue to talk and and catch up. And honestly, she's, you know, been advising, you know, us on some of this product development work that we've been doing now based on some of her experiences. But that organization is still going on. I talked to a student founder from WashU who's interested in applying to the Tinto University Investment Program. And he's running Pyramid Productions at Wash U now. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. That's wow. amazing. Yeah. Interesting. Uh-huh. Okay. And then, so tell us now about ID8. What actually is ID8? When will the MVP come out? When are you looking to go full li- fully live? 
Tell us a little bit about that, the timeline in, in, in the company. What we're looking to do is basically connect students with the top student entrepreneurs, engineers, designers, scientists across the university ecosystem across the country. And we want to help them maximize their potential by offering them access to content from industry leaders and then opportunities for funding, internships and jobs. So we really want to be a student success tool. The way that we make money, though, because that doesn't say anything about how we make money. And that's one of the other things I learned being on the venture side. <laughs> doesn't matter what your tagline is. Yeah, you better make some money. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we make money in two different ways. A, we sell our talent to employers. And we've been talking about talent for half this conversation, yes. right? That's super important. And the students that we have on our, on our platform, they're the builders. They're the folks who are looking to launch their own startups or launch their own nonprofits. And we know that 90% of startups fail. At the collegiate level, it's going to be even higher than that. Yeah. And so with that being said, all of a sudden we can go to companies, especially some of your startups. And when I say startups, I'm not talking about your companies under 10 employees, your startups that are starting to do well and they've got some firm footing and beginning to hire entry level folks. And we can say, look, we've got the cream of the crop entry level talent. This may not be a Google person, but they develop their own app. And that person is going to work better in a startup because they're not going to need all the structure and handholding because they've built their own things before. And so that's our one revenue stream is, is through selling to employers. Our other revenue stream is selling the platform to universities. And so we're building out like a back end admin portal that career centers, entrepreneurship centers can use to basically track what students are up to and then be able to point them in the right directions as to opportunities that would make the most sense based upon their interests, their talents, their skill sets. OK. Are there any universities right now that you are targeting that this is the time to shoot your shot and let them know that you're interested in their business? Definitely. First, want to give you know a huge shout out to our HBCUs and our HSIs, historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions. We really want to equip and empower both the students and the universities to be able to help their students maximize and, and reach their full potential. Other than that, I think large public institutions, those are who we're really looking for. One of the things that you know I found, for example, talk to the University of Oklahoma, and I will say every student that I have met, and I know that I'm not meeting a huge percentage of the school, but every student that I've met from University of Oklahoma is absolutely outstanding. I'm talking about students that have developed their own apps, students who have written books, all of these types of things. At Wash U, we had six and a half thousand undergrads. At University of Oklahoma, they have 25,000 undergrads. Wow. Same number of career advisors at each school. Okay. And so our platform provides immense value to those larger public institutions because, sure, I can't sit down with you the way that someone at a smaller, you know, private school could, but I can still see what you're up to. We don't have to sit down and talk. And I can ping you and send you a message and say, oh, it's coming to campus. You should go to their career fair or you should go to their talk or you should connect with this other student who has a similar interest, but a complementary skill set to you. Yeah. OK, the, I was going to say when I graduated back in 2017, obviously, when I <laughs> as everyone kind of as, as I kind of get as I give away my age on the podcast, <laughs> I'm actually 45 years old. <laughs> uh, just kidding. If I would have gone to a career counselor my freshman year in college and said, I want to go work at a startup, they would have been like. What are you thinking? Like right. you don't come to college for four years with the mindset that I want to go work for this company that could probably fail within the next one to two years. Yeah. Right. And if you go to a career center today, it's probably the same attitude. Like they're going to push you to wherever you are, whatever the main industry is there, or they're going to send you to some industry, like not industry, but some career path that's banking or consulting, doing accounting or sending you to grad school. Like they, they like they career development Offices, I feel, are measured basically in the job placement of secure jobs. Like they're not really there to really stoke the fire uh, fires of your passion. And that's one of the things I like about ID8 is you're filling this gap that like a lot of I feel like career development offices are are missing. It's like you have these all these students on campus who obviously and they might be studying something like finance, which is what I did, but at the same time have a passion for technology and wanting to learn about startups. And that's one of the beauties of I love about ID8 is you fill that gap. You can really be that sort of catalyst to help these students find these non-traditional career paths. Definitely. And I think we provide best of both worlds, right? In terms of companies that we've reached out to and begun developing relationships with, the average size of the company is 60 employees. And they're still very much a startup. They're yeah. far from a Fortune 500 company, but 
Well, it's, they got the legs on their cells. Yeah. Yeah. And, but you think about just a rock star software engineer from, you know, the University of Alabama. That's not a target school for Google. They could still be a rock star. And now all of a sudden they're playing a huge role in one of Birmingham's up and coming company successes. And depending on how early the company is, I've seen companies that for their first hundred employees, everyone gets a small amount of stock options to where you're a young person, you're coming in, you've got equity in the startup, the valuation of the company increases, you got to exit. And now all of a sudden you got the experience for however many years it was you got a little bit of payout on the back end and you're like, man, I want to go do this now. So I guess like talk about that a little bit more. And obviously Aaron and I both know about ID. It's this pay to hire model. Like no one else is really doing this. So what does it again, touch on that again. What does that look like for a college student? This is something we're super excited about. It's amazing. Yeah. And basically we charge uh, employers a small fee for them to hire students from the platform. But a percentage of that fee, we pay back to students as a signing bonus that comes from us. The company can give, you know, the students their own signing bonus, but we want to say, look, we value you. We're not just trying to make you a number that we're putting over here. We want to let you know and put some money behind it that we appreciate what you bring to the table. So that's awesome. That's so cool. It's And obviously getting hired out of college, there are not a whole lot of folks, obviously, unless you go to one of the uh, Ivy League schools and you go and work at the Goldman's of the world and you get your signing bonus and whatnot. But that's awesome. That's so cool to be able to get hired at a company and have a little extra money in your pocket and you get to pursue something that you're passionate about, which is super cool. The beauty of of Ideate is you are actually coming in before a student really needs to get on like a, on a platform like, like LinkedIn, because you're like, Hey, here's some work you can go do and kind of, you can build this portfolio of things that you've achieved for all these companies that you, that is, is worth so much more than just a, a resume full of, Here's the clubs I was part of. Here's the volunteer work that I did. You actually moved the needle for a couple of different businesses. Like that's amazing. Yep. And and that's one of the things I think pipeline is going to be super important for us as a company, both pipeline for students to help prepare them to be really exciting hires, but also pipeline for companies that maybe we get them before they're ready to pay to hire, but maybe they need an intern to build out like a web page for them or do a digital marketing campaign or do some design mock-ups. And then all of a sudden you're a sophomore or junior. And you've had an opportunity to do some great work that you can display. First of all, those companies, if they grow, they're going to be like, man, we got some great work from ID8, from students. And if they're at a point where they're starting to hire entry-level folks full-time, they're like, this is our place to go. We had a great experience in the past. And then for those students who are looking to go get jobs, it's look, here's what I did. You guys are a development platform for talent, but also a network. So it's going to help develop you. And then we're going to help you find a job. And that's if I'm a college student, it's a no brainer to sign up for something like IDA. And the thing is, I talked about kind of failure rates for entrepreneurs. We want the students to meet each other and start companies that succeed. Yeah. We just know that most aren't going to, but we want to put them in position to succeed. I feel like the biggest success story that would just have me hundred gallon smile is you have a student that meets a few other students. They build something. It starts to grow, become successful. They bring on maybe a few interns for special projects through the platform. And then they ultimately start hiring from the platform. And then you've got basically like the full life cycle, like the whole inception of the company to its hiring as it's reached maturity has happened through the platform. And when that happens for the first time, <laughs> um, the world will know. That's, sure. a, that's when you got the bell in the office and you just start ringing it for every single company that gets created on the ID8 platform. <laughs> yep, yep. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I think even as we sell to employers, if we're like, hey, student teams have raised this much capital on the platform, this many companies have been launched on the platform, that's signaling to employers is like, these students are the real deal. It's not like we just went and just tried to get any student who would get on the platform, but they produce results. Yeah. Or it's not like that they're getting shotgun blasted with resumes from students. And it's a perfect kind of, you know, match between the two of them. Yep. Or yeah. it can lead to that perfect match. For, definitely. Yeah. yeah. I, I wish you all could see the smile that's on Chandler's face, the way he lit up when we begin to talk about the evolution of the student becoming now the business owner and hiring the interns and whatnot. You just lit up and the passion that, that you spoke with that about uh, is just 
it sends chills through the room. And so you really believe this thing. And apparently you've won people over to believe in it with you. And I believe this is going to be a great success as you raise your first round here and you go uh, forward. I want to deal a little bit with Chandler, the the man and the founder, right? What type of stress as a husband does this put on your marriage on your yeah he's nodding his head <laughs> what type of uh well, how, what does that balancing a a a dream that needs to be birthed as well as a wife that needs to be tended to and cared for and feel secure ar- around you stepping away from a job and now into the abyss into an unknown uncharted waters talk a little bit about that yeah i think first thing i have to say my wife sahi that's right call her out man yeah. shout her out go yeah, ahead yeah. yeah there is no one on this earth that believes in me as much as she does which is a blessing and i think that is part of the reason why any move that i've made in life thus far like she supported and this is not to go into like marriage advice or anything like that but i feel like if you're going to partner yourself with someone they they've got to really see that in you yeah. um and really believe in you yeah and then i think the next thing that you talked about is the stresses i will say life is a lot easier when i have a job it is a lot easier. I feel like the things that I've done that have propelled me both personally, financially, and also just in terms of like career status have been those times when I haven't had a job, but life has been so much harder during those times, even if things are going well. There's just so many stressors, right? There's, hey, if I don't get this right, it could all fall apart versus if you're at a job, if you don't get it right, we'll get it right tomorrow. And one of the things I will definitely be a huge proponent for founders is not shying away from tending to your mental health. That is super important. It is a very lonely journey in the very beginning. And sometimes it seems like the weight of the world is on your shoulders and you can almost miss out on the enjoyment of the opportunity because you feel like there's like so much pressure to succeed. You've got folks that have given you money. You're responsible to them. You've got your own dream. You've got sacrifices that you've made that maybe impact your family financially in the the near term. Yeah. And being able to call all of those things out and say, hey, I've got a support system whether it's family and mentors, whether you've got a clinician or a therapist that you're going to see, having that support system, it's important at all times in life. But founder journey, you've got to have it or else you're setting yourself up for failure, no matter how bright you are, no matter how good your idea is. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's that's been so overglorified these past few years is you need to be this founder who 24 seven is just turned on. Like you, you can, you never turn it off. You eat, sleep and breathe your company. And for the most part, there's a part of that where, where like that, someone that someone needs to be correct. Like you need to obviously have that burning desire for your business to succeed and like, and wanting to execute on your vision. But at the same time, like the importance of balance is just so important. Like you have to be able to turn it off. You have to be able to recharge because if you don't, you're going to be a terrible founder. Like you said, people are so dependent on you and you want to give them your best. At some point in time, you just have to shut it down and then you can recuperate and then you go after it again. Yeah. And I think being able to have some of that separation in your life is important, multiple levels, being able to be considerate of the people around you and not just constantly on and thinking about and talking about what you're building. I think that also makes you a better manager because all of a sudden you're thinking about not just what's on your mind, but what on, what's on everybody else's on the team's mind. And you're getting to flex that muscle in the off time of your company. And I think a lot of people might not necessarily think about it that way. The type of friend that you are, the type of spouse that you are, the type of parent that you are, a lot of those things spill into the type of founder, CEO, manager that you are. And so paying attention to those other components of your life. One of, one of Sahi's aunts, whenever she sees you and you ask her how she's doing, she always says, everything is everything. And to that point, the parent that you are, the friend that you are, a lot of those things will spill over into the type of CEO and founder that you are. So true. One of the questions I'm always wondering is from founders and, and obviously now that you've been on both sides of the table, what's different this time around, like raising money for you, like from the, from that first time when you, you, when your last company in Atlanta, what was it maybe can, you know, contrast your first time with this time around? A lot of things. I was asking for too little money. And I thought by asking for less money, I would increase my likelihood of raising money. Yeah. But it was doing the exact opposite effect because then it's like, how long is this money going to last you for? So in four months, you're going to need to go back out and raise some more money. Then all of a sudden for the investors that I'm talking to, they're like, 
this guy's not thinking things through long enough. Mm -hmm. And for me, I was like, I I know it's going to take a while, but let me just ask for less because maybe I can get less that way. If folks really believe in you, they'll stand behind you. And if, you know, the amount that they put in doesn't fill in the need, they'll go tap into their network to introduce you to folks if they believe in you. And I think it's really important to think about, okay, how much money do I need to build out my team and for us to last for 18 months? Because again, like in the very beginning, we talked about pivots, right? Things are inevitably not going to go 100% according to plan. You got to give yourself that wiggle room. And so that's definitely one, one big difference. I think another big difference is the ability to sell people on that game changing, like world beating component of your idea that you have. For the moves, I was a little bit afraid to share this because I thought that it was going to make you know, me seem a little bit unfocused and like fantastical out there. But I really envision the platform almost being like a social networking platform for events. Like, hey, Aaron, I created this event. We're going to watch the Monday night football game. I'm going to invite Jesse. I'm going to invite Sean, do it all through the app. And we can just have a little get together. I never really talked about that view of this could be something that literally everyone could use, not just event hosts. Whereas now with ID8, I think it's really important for me to share the largest, grandest vision. Because at the end of the day, again, if folks believe in you, then they're going to want to see that. You're Like someone's not going to invest in you that's, hey, tone it down, dumb it down a little bit. Don't go that far. Those aren't the people that are really supporting you. And so I think being able to sell on the full vision, I think raising sufficient capital, and then what we started off with, the team piece, yeah. so important. Yeah. And in your opinion, like for founders, and we definitely have a lot of founders who listen to the show, what's going to make their lives easier when they go and start talking to investors? Like what, what sort of advice do you have for some of these founders who might be out there ready to be prepared to raise that first round of funding? How, what is the best way to go about it? And what should they shy away from? And what are some things that they need to go full speed at? I think being able to understand that you or being able to exhibit that you understand the problem that you're solving intimately. Honestly, to me, that's more important than like the actual solution. Because again, like you figure out, you talk to customers, you might change this, change that a little bit. But if you really intimately understand the problem, then you're way better positioned to be able to create a solution for it. And so I think- Or make that pivot. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. When founders do that in pitch meetings, I think that's great. I think coming in, having that team as well, being able to show, look, I can get real people to really buy in because I'm not going to give you money if you can't convince somebody else to come work with you. Like yeah. that just doesn't make sense because is it that you don't have the money to pay people or is it that you can't convince people to work with you? That's going to be the question that's in my mind with the investor had on all the time. And I think also being able to realistically explain how big this thing can grow and not saying, hey, we're building an app for to help people sleep better on airplanes and then saying, oh, the entire three trillion dollar travel industry is my target market. Understanding, look, this is how many customers that I have. This is how much I charge. This is how big this thing can grow. And this is our path to get there. Being able to tell that story like very coherently, here's where we're going. And where we're going, I understand what it looks like, and I understand the steps that it takes to get there. The half baked idea, the half baked ideas, that's not getting anybody anywhere unless you sold your last company for X million dollars. Yeah, you know, we'll see. Right, you know, investors like us, we see right. Through, we'll see right through that. Yep, yep. ID8 clearly not as planted here in Tulsa is going to be creating jobs and opportunities for the native Tulsans and people who may be moving to the area. Can you talk a little bit about what that means to you that you're actually creating jobs and opportunities for people and and for communities? Yeah. So that was one of my things that got me excited about entrepreneurship on like a higher level as I started to grow during my collegiate career. I actually wrote my capstone, which is like our version of a thesis on how entrepreneurship and intentional venture capital are really the best vehicles for economic development and job creation. Fortune 500 company, they're going to be happy when they implement a software solution that helps them improve margins because maybe they need a few fewer employees. And I'm not saying that they'll fire those folks because typically studies have shown that they just find other roles for those folks to do. But like, it's not about creating more jobs. It's about increasing margins. Exactly. Whereas in the early days of a startup, it, it is important not to just make some of these things like vanity metrics, but a sign that things are going well is when you're hiring more people. 
And I think the last piece about just like the meaning of it being here, I think about the institutions here in the state, the collegiate institutions, Oklahoma University, Oklahoma State, Tulsa University, Langston, Oral Roberts University. You got a lot of those graduates that end up leaving and going to Dallas or other cities. And so being able to connect the strong startups here in Tulsa with the top talent that's in the state, I think, obviously, I think that will help the startups in like the local ecosystem here in the short term. But I think also in the long term, by bringing those folks here, giving them those experiences here, connecting them with one another here, all of a sudden you've got your next crop of founders that are moving to Tulsa or staying in Tulsa rather than going to Dallas or whatever other cities that, you know, you find students from like the institutions here going to. And I think we'll see that in a lot of situations. Like we gave the example of University of Alabama and Birmingham startup. I'd love for us to be able to take all these tier two cities and really just turn up their like talent a level by being able to get the top students that are in that region to go work for earlier stage companies in their region. Because at the end of the day, you talked about how like cost was maybe not necessarily a huge value add for Tulsa. There are a lot of cities that are trying to do things like Tulsa. Yeah. And so being able to help empower that by creating a platform where you're connecting the talent and the companies that are trying to grow there, I think it helps everybody. Yeah. The uh, And it's another thing that ID8 solves at this kind of macro level is this sort of brain drain that you see. Like our best and brightest, they're not going to stay in Tulsa. They're not going to stay, they're going to stay in Birmingham, you know, or they're going to go to, uh, they're going to go to the coast. That's where the resources are. That's where they can make the most money, obviously. And for me, it's, that's, that's great for them. They're, they are giving, getting the opportunity to perform at, at the best of their, uh, capabilities, which is amazing. And to me, unfortunately, instead of going to build things, they're going to work at McKinsey or they're at, at Goldman Sachs. And that's probably an episode for another day where I could spend an hour just telling you how, <laughs> how stupid I think that is. But the idea is this, again, like it's this platform where it's like it can really educate them on opportunities in their own backyard and, and not just any sort of opportunities. It's You can actually go and build something. You're not going to just be in an office working on an Excel sheet 24 seven or making PowerPoints. Like you, you can actually go and build something and have real responsibility. And like that's, a, that's, a, that's awesome. And obviously I, I very much resonate with that being a, a venture for America fellow, but it's, it's a beautiful thing. And it's, uh, again, that's, that's what I love about ID8. It's you're, you're to help with the whole brain train. And to take it back to a sports <laughs> and a basketball analogy, I guarantee you, I put money on it. If you ask LeBron James what championship meant the most to him, it was the one that he won at home in yep. Cleveland, yeah. where he grew up, where he developed, yeah. and then he was able to you know, win himself. Yeah. And I think also- Obviously, it took time, but like he, he did it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it would be super empowering to be able to give students that opportunity yeah. to win at home or wherever they had their formative years where they grew. I think also with COVID and just the way of the world, you're starting to get more and more people- that are like, hey, maybe the big city's not actually super enticing. And maybe I, I want to go, you know, check out somewhere else. I can stack up a little bit more money because cost of living is lower. My travel times are, are a little bit, living is just easier. Yeah. And, and you're not in a rush. Like here, it's like, and Aaron, you can testify on this too. It's like the way of living out in a city in Tulsa is, I, I never feel like I'm constantly in a rush or it's just those. I don't want to say slower way of life, but it's, it's not as like demanding. Does that make sense? You're not like, there's not, obviously there's a lot going on and it's also, which is amazing, but it's like, you're not necessarily consistently caught up in the hustle and bustle of everything. Like you can do your own thing. Yeah. And which is nice. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I think that's why you're seeing that trend for people. They're like, what, why was I here? Like for me, like I grew up in Dallas and then like that year I spent in Atlanta, you spend an hour commuting one way <laughs> and like all of a sudden you're like where did my life go yeah i don't have time for hanging out with my friends or a time to spend time with my kids and my wife or a time to work on my side hustle or side project and so i think for us we're positioned very nicely because that's a lot of the companies that we're targeting and we're seeing more people move out of the larger metros and so we're helping people just accelerate that shift that's like already happening a little bit as well
one more question for Chandler. So one of the things that people were really high on about Tulsa and go, taking it and just focusing on like uh, us as a startup ecosystem was obviously when you go to a lot of these other cities like Tulsa, they have these, organi- they have organizations, the same exact organizations that we have. They have things like 36 degrees North, they have innovation labs, they have different organizations that try to recruit companies there, get startups, to open up offices and talent development boot camps and, and, and things of that sort. But one of the things that a lot of folks expressed to me in Tulsa was that's great. But in Tulsa, one of the really cool things is like, there's like this alignment across organizations and it's like, they're all working towards the same thing. And as a founder now, what do you think about that? And like, what, what do you, what did you think about it when you were, were investing in Atento? Yeah. First piece, I want to say, even before I made the transition full-time to ID8, I reached out to our friends at the Holberton school And they were like, hey, would you like to pitch your company to our students to see if you can recruit some technical talent? And that was one, two emails happened super quick like that to speak to the alignment across organizations. My wife is Sahi. She's working for Tulsa Innovation Labs right now. And I will say it is really cool to have a little bit of behind the scenes insight to stuff that we're working on. And I won't say anything. I look at the future of some of the work that Tinto is going to be doing, and they are laying a foundation for Tinto to, in the future, not have to look outside of town so much to bring folks in, but have a ton of talent, a ton of structure, a ton of programs in place for Tinto to be able to cherry pick, hey, this is great. This is great. This is great. We need you in our portfolio. Yeah. And even like with Tulsa Remote, when spending time at a Tinto, there were times where, you know, someone from Tulsa Remote was like, hey, you got to meet this founder. They just moved to town. They're great. And I will say for me, the connectivity has been all world. And I'll give one last example of the connectivity. There was an individual who applied or who's been just working through like our entrepreneur in residence program. And he's a veteran has been working and consulting in oil and gas and a number of other industries for years and years. And I talked to him about a few things that I was working on, told him about ID8. And he was like, oh, got to introduce you to these two folks. And the two folks that he introduced me to immediately uh, senior software engineer, 20 years of experience. And our team is young. Just be a good person to talk to and meet. <laughs> and then a senior salesperson who was basically running sales at one of Tulsa's most successful startups, but coincidentally was an early employee at College Club, which in the late 90s was the number three email host behind Yahoo and AOL. And it's like, when I, And this is not to speak negatively about other cities, but when I was in St. Louis, when I was in Atlanta, when I was in Dallas, I wasn't getting introduced to people who were then introducing me to people that like fit my exact needs in that exact moment in time in life. And so that alignment, like you can't put a price on that. Yeah. That's awesome. That's it. That needs to be the quote. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. All right. Let's wrap it up. Final question here. Chandler, obviously you used to be the host of this podcast. Aaron and I are taking over. Any parting words of advice for Aaron and I as we begin our podcasting careers? I'll say just have fun with it. It it was a great experience for me and and also use it as a learning opportunity. For me, I was able to talk to some folks that I had looked up to and seen as industry leaders and, and thought leaders and be able to ask them questions that I maybe wouldn't be able to ask them if we were in, you know, meeting doing business with one another. Like it's a great opportunity. Obviously, this is a great way to share publicity for things that we have going on, but it's also a great way to share knowledge and try to use it as a learning opportunity as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for joining us, Chandler. Obviously, super excited for you as you as you take this next leap, starting ID8 and building it here in Tulsa. And obviously, we are so fortunate to have you in Tulsa and, and to have this team coming to build ID8 in Tulsa. Can't be couldn't be more excited for you. Thank you, Chandler. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Thanks, awesome. Chandler. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to our latest episode of Be Atento. You can find this podcast anywhere podcasts can be found. Make sure to subscribe and to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Don't forget to follow Atento Capital across all social media platforms. And we look forward to speaking with you all again on the next episode of Be Atento. Be Atento.